So in this video, I'll be going over practice exam three, talking about things that you should include um, in your setup and things that I'll be taking off points for if they're not in there. Um, so I'm gonna start off by doing that. So things uh, I'll be looking for in the setup of your problem. Um, so as always you're going to need a coordinate system that doesn't change and again it's it's not going to change for the rest of this course that's the first thing that you should do you know you draw your picture define your coordinate system um, that should be pretty much second nature at this point. The second now for torques, um, you'll need to choose a positive rotation direction. So what do I mean by that? Well, we've been choosing counterclockwise. That's a terrible arrow. Uh, we've been choosing counterclockwise CCW to be the positive direction. Um, it doesn't matter. You can choose clockwise to be the positive direction. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. It dictates what sign your torque is depending on what the torque will cause the object to do, which way it will cause it to rotate. So if the torque causes a rotation in the counterclockwise direction, then it will be a positive torque. So this needs to be occluded. Uh, you know, everybody did fairly well with that. There were some spots where it was missing out of people, but it wasn't a, a frequent miss from people. So just include that <clears throat> when you draw your coordinate system, you can just stick this right in the middle up here like the arrow I've just drawn, and that, that'll be fine. So don't forget that. And then three, four energy problems. You need to define where your gravitational potential energy is equal to zero. You can also just choose the H equals zero line and that, that will suffice as well. You know, you can label that line either as potential energy, gravitational potential energy zero, like I have here at the start, or you can have it as the H equals zero line and I'll know what you're talking about. But that needs to be included anytime you're dealing with gravitational potential energy. You need to show me where your zero point is because that value is based off of this zero point. So those are the three main things that I'm going to be looking for. Um, in addition to the normal diagrams, free body diagrams, rigid free body diagrams, motion diagrams, all of the stuff that we've been doing. But these specifically, are the easy points. Um, you know, you're talking a coordinate system and a PEG or the potential energy of uh, gravitational potential energy zero point. Uh, those are, that's going to be two to three points. So if you don't have those, then, you know, you're already starting with a 17, 18 out of 20. You know, you're starting with a 90 or an 85 uh, just for missing those. So make sure you have them. They're important because they dictate the signs and the magnitudes of certain values. So you have to have them to be able to accurately solve a problem. So if you have questions about that, just reach out. Let me know. Um, you know, I don't want it to be any kind of surprise when uh, if, if I take off points for that. Um, I want to be upfront as possible. So if you have a question, let me know. So getting started here, we have question one. So question one is dealing with two cars that are coming towards each other. 
they have certain velocities and certain masses um, and then they collide and they have different velocities after the collision. And so this is just a simple, not a simple, I don't want to use that word. This is a standard collision problem where you'll use conservation of momentum. So we've done this a ton of times. Uh, so this is something you should be familiar with, with doing, should be able to handle this type of problem. We're given the initial velocities of each cart and then you're given one of the cart's final velocities and you're asked to solve for the velocity of the unknown or you're asked to solve for the unknown velocity of one of the carts. So you'll just apply the conservation of momentum equation that we have right here and solve for the unknown velocity. Again, Defining your coordinate system, uh, especially in conservation of momentum problems or collision problems, uh, the direction matters. Uh, that that uh, was a spot where some people messed up on because it dictates what the sign of the velocity is going to be. So if your sign if your signs aren't right, then your um, then your conservation of energy equation, what I've got underlined right here, uh, that's going to be way off. So make sure you define your coordinate system so you can choose the signs of your velocities accordingly. The second question asks um, the impulse experienced by child one. So that's the, the cart one impulse. Remember impulse impulse which is j is equal to the change in momentum so m final velocity minus the initial velocity so the key here is that this is the change in momentum of a certain system so since we're wondering what the impulse is or the change in momentum of the child one or the first car you would want to ch find the change in momentum of the first car so don't mix and match these velocities you know the velocity of the the second child or the second car with the first one you want to stay consistent that this is the final velocity of the first one minus the initial velocity of the first one stay consistent um, you know, there's a lot of velocities floating around in these kind of problems. So this is something that, that could, could be a potential trip up spot. Then we have the average force experienced by the child. If the collision occurs over 0.15 seconds, and now you use the relationship of the change in momentum or the impulse and relating it to a force applied over a certain time. Because remember, the f impulse is just a force applied over a certain time. So impulse is also equal to a force, average force, over a certain time interval. And remember, that force causes a change in momentum. And how drastic of a change is dictated by the size of that force and the time that that force is applied. Think back to the lab with the egg drop. Um, the change in momentum is the same for every single one when dropped from a certain height. But the egg breaks in certain scenarios and doesn't break in certain scenarios because of the force and the time that that force is acting. So then you just, you just use what you found in the second part and you use it to determine what the average force is. Uh, this is a large force. I mean, this is why um, 
this is why collisions are are bad basically um, this is why you want to have seat belts on because there's a there's a large force acting on you and if there's nothing to stop you then that large force is what sends you flying um, through the windshield in this case it's bumper cars but this is this is why bumper cars aren't supposed to be going very fast um, this is why they have that rubber bumper up on the front to kind of extend the collision time because this is a very large force and this is the force that it's acting on your body this is acting on your brain um, so this is this is why uh, there's those safety features with those things So moving on to the second problem, this is going to be switching gears. This isn't a, a um, collision problem. This is something else. So we have a family situation where we have a door uh, and it keeps hitting the wall. So there's nothing stopping it from hitting the wall. So you may have seen um, door stoppers before where they have a coil here and then they're attached to this like rubber rubber bumper. It kind of looks like that. And you know, there's your door or part of your door. And so it stops the door from hitting the wall. You may have seen those. So that is what this problem is centered around. So it's centered around um, figuring out how stiff that spring needs to be given the requirements that the family wants. Uh, so if you have if you have one of these in your house, go check it out uh, and try and push, push the spring in and, and figure, out, um, figure out how much force you need to be able to push it in. So my guess is, if yours is like mine, uh, it's very difficult to push it in. And the reason why is that you don't want it to be a very loose spring, a very soft spring. Because if a door is moving quickly, then it's not going to be able to um, take on all of that energy. So it has the potential of hitting the wall. So a stiff spring. So we're expecting something with a very large spring constant or a K um, because it needs to be able to stop the door in a very, very short distance. So what type of problem is this? This is definitely a conservation of energy problem. So what are you going to need to do? Well, you're going to need to figure out where your initial point is and where your final point is. So I've got the initial point as being this door. The final point is the compression of the spring. I still have my coordinate system I have a potential energy of gravitational potential energy line of zero. Of course, you know, we're not moving up and down, so you don't need to define a gravitational potential energy of zero for this problem since we're not moving up and down. It's just zero everywhere. It's just constant, so it really doesn't matter. And then at this point, it's, it's really using our seven term energy equation and, and eliminating which ones aren't pertinent to the problem. So we have no friction acting in this problem. So the work done by non-conservative forces is zero. Like I said, it's not moving up and down. So the gravitational potential energy is negligible in this problem. We don't need to worry about it. We're starting off with the door away from the spring, so the spring potential energy is zero. And so we're just left with kinetic energy at the start. We want the spot where the spring stops the door. 
So the kinetic energy at the end is going to be zero.